they'd rather do that. Turns out that behaviour's been critical right from the get-go. Right? We don't actually know who domesticated who. So we always thought that we were the smart ones and we took wolf cubs into our, into our little tribal areas because we, we thought that would be a good idea. We could domesticate them and turn them into hunting companions and things like that. What have I done? Good, OK. Oh, she's so good, isn't she? We love Mia. So it used to be thought that we domesticated dogs, but then Ray Coppinger came along and said, maybe that's not the case. Maybe they domesticated us. Maybe they moved into our camps of their own accord because we had rubbish lying around, because we do, and, and things like that. And they actually selected us. So the people who liked them let the wolves hang around, had a survival advantage, got to breed more, and that's why these days so many people love dogs, because we've been selected for it over thousands and thousands of years. So we don't know what the truth is. We can't tell. Archaeological evidence doesn't exist to answer that question. But the fact is we've been together for a long, long time. Right? Dogs and humans go together for a long, long time. And we do know that dogs have got absolutely incredible what we call interspecific social cognitive skills, which is psychobabble for they can read our minds. <laughs> right? Dogs are amazing in terms of figuring out what we want, what we think, and there's a whole lot of research going on around the world now. This is Rico. Some of you would have read about Rico. All those boxes of toys he can identify by name. Right? 200 of them. Dogs shouldn't be able to do that according to our understanding of dog brains, but they can. They can also figure out what you're pointing at. They, and, you know, people who herd, they, they know that. Dogs can do things that they shouldn't be able to do from an evolutionary perspective, and we're just starting to get a handle on that now. So behaviour's always been critical right from the start, and it stayed critical during breed development. Dogs were selectively bred because of what they did, not because of how they looked. So we had dogs that run very fast, we have dogs that pull sleds, we have dogs that herd sheep, we have dogs that guard animals, and we have dogs that do the dishes for us. <laughs> you, know? and you can kind of imagine where Labradors came from, can't you, when we needed dogs to clean up the rubbish dumps? Right? So we've been selecting dogs on the basis of their behaviour for a long, long time. And you all know that, you're doggy people, right? Have any of you seen the videos of these silver foxes? They're amazing. I know, nearly everybody knows the story of the silver foxes now, but a lot of people haven't seen the videos. This was an experiment done in Russia where they farm these silver foxes and they farm them for their fur. And the conditions are horrible, as you can see. There's cages and cages of foxes in. Uh, uh, just terrible. One of the problems with foxes is they're not domesticated. They're not like dogs. They don't like people. They're very scared, very timid. So a guy called Dmitry Balyaev set out 50 years ago to see if he could fix that a little bit, and he selected for tameness. So he had a two-minute test where he walks up and he tries to put his hand in, and he picked out the foxes that were most tolerant of that, and he bred them. Okay? This is a video of a normal fox. My mouse doesn't work. Yes. Can you? I can't see it. Oh. Oh, no, I get it. There. Now. Right? <laughs> Hang on, I have to look behind me. What? Yeah, but I can't see where the mouse is. I still can't see it. Can you see it? Must be the angle. There it is. Yeah, it just it disappears all the time. Hang on, try this. Yeah. You tell us when it's in the middle of the screen. <laughs> yeah, no, it won't do it. No. Damn. So keep I'll keep talking. What will I talk about? <laughs> okay, watch that. And listen if you've got sound. Have we got sound? So this is the two minute test that they do. A research assistant, this is what PhD students are great for doing really silly things. Stand up, walk up to the cage and stand there for a minute and then attempt to put your hand in. Right? <laughs> we can't do that these days, ethics won't let us. So this is your normal silver fox. Before they started doing the experiment, before they'd done any selection for behaviour, this is what a silver fox does. 
Okay. Oh, there you go. You know we've got to get the next one to work now. Okay, so that's basically what it does for the whole two minutes. Right? Then we have these ones, which is after a few generations. Oh, tell me when I'm close. Can't see it at all. I wonder if there's a play button somewhere. Let's get off the paper, it might work. Okay, so this is what they found basically was that the foxes changed fairly quickly, much more quickly than anybody imagined that they would. And you can see that the cages are still the same, they haven't changed anything in terms of that. Isn't that bad? There it is. Thank you. So this is after a few generations. Same test. Okay, pretty cool, huh? So what that shows is, is that what you select for is what you get. If you select for tame, friendly behaviour and you don't worry about anything else, that's what you get. So those foxes are still living in terrible conditions. The cages are still appalling, but they have much better welfare now because they're not spending their whole life being terrified. Right? So that's an improvement in animal welfare, even though, you know. But apart from that, it shows us that you get what you, what you select for, okay? Now, humans aren't the only things who mess with things like that. But nature's been messing with selection for millions of years and has got what it's selected for. If you select for long necks, they get longer and longer. If you select for big mouths, they get bigger and bigger. So it works for both behaviour and confirmation. If you pick a breeding goal and breed for it, and Mike Goddard's going to talk about that later on, you're going to get that. That's how it works. Okay? And of course, dogs are an amazing example of that because we've been breeding them for quite a few decades now and we've selected them for different things and that's what we've got. The most amazing animals. Look at them, they're just beautiful, aren't they? Just lovely, lovely animals to look at because we've selected for different things. And that's terrific. But, there's always a but in science, right? Selection for one thing can affect other things and it can do it in unpredictable ways and that's the scary bit. So this is your average silver fox, right? After two generations, this fox was tamer, friendlier. After about six generations, they looked like that, right? So after about four generations, they started wagging their tail. After about six generations, you started seeing changes in, how, in their colour pattern, how they looked. But no one was selecting for these. All they selected for was that simple behavioural test. They started changing how they looked. And after about eight or ten generations, their skeletal structure changed. They're, they're a different animal now, right? Completely different animal. Kind of look like a mutant border collie. You know, a little bit weird, right? Now, if you're breeding for confirmation, if you're judging a confirmation ring, they're not going to do too well. Right? If you've got your standard for silver foxes, they're not going to do too well. If you're breeding for pet foxes, they might do okay. People kind of like cute scruffy. Right? So what you breed for, you sometimes get things you don't expect and that can be a bonus or it can be a real problem. It's hard to predict. This is another one of my dog, Sherbet. Absolutely lovely dog. Bred to look beautiful in a show ring. This is her herding sheep. She's an Australian shepherd. That's what they're supposed to do. She's hopeless. She could not herd a sheep to save herself. Just terrible. I've got all these photos of her sprawled on sheep upside down with her legs in the air. Really bad at it. This is another one of my Australian Shepherds, Boomer. He's from Working Lines. He can herd sheep pretty well. Right? So they're both Australian Shepherds. They're both registered the same, everything the same. Completely different behavioural traits because of what they've been selected for. Sherbet's been selected to look pretty. Boomer's been selected to chase sheep. And that's what that is. Who's that? That's not my dog, is it? Someone else's dog. Okay, so with breeding, the more things you're trying to select for, the harder it gets. 
because you're trying to juggle things, right? And traits can be linked in unexpected ways. So we've got some old research showing, for example, that hip dysplasia was negatively correlated with temperament traits in German Shepherd dogs. This is a particular population of German Shepherd dogs. They were trying to breed a particular behavioural characteristic and what they got was bad hips. Never would have seen it coming. But now we know more about genetics now and we're working on those sort of issues, but it was a real surprise for everybody.